so happy to be joined by my good old friends, Jeff Keeley of Spike TV yeah. and Steven Totillo of Kotaku. Thank you, guys. Um, so, yes, we saw a lot this morning. The internet has been none too subtle in terms of its reaction. Um, let, let's, let's actually talk a little bit about the things that were not detailed that are so important to people out there, which is the sense of always on. There seems to be some degree of mixed messaging and, and uncertainty. What have you felt about this? Okay, so first of all, there's always on and there's always online. And those have been used interchangeably, and I think it's indisputable. I think it's indisputable, you see how confident I am, that always on is in terms of a powered state. It seems like that's going to be a thing, that there's going to be very little reason for you to ever completely deactivate it, and you'll be able to walk into a room and just say something and it'll be there, right? It'll be active. The always online, that's confusing. What we're hearing most recently, Phil Harrison was just telling me in an interview, Phil Harrison's one of the top guys at Xbox, that yes, you can play single player games offline, but that the system, he believes it would be tw every 24 hours, it would need to have checked the internet. So the supp supposition there is, if I go, if my system's been offline for more than a day, it wouldn't let me play a single player game. But even he didn't sound completely confident, Adam, so I don't know. <laughs> which, 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 something we should talk about in one second. Um, the, the, we, we just went on a tour and we actually were told that the Kinect sensor will be in a very low powered state. That's how you can say Xbox on and it turns it on. Well, and I remember, you know, the Wii back in the day, they talked about Wii Connect 24 and how that was sort of yeah. going to be always on to some degree. I don't think they really used it, but it was going to blink when it was your birthday and things like that. But yeah, I think it'll be always on. The other thing that I think people forget about with always online is that it's a it's a software decision. So I don't know if Microsoft has even really decided what the ultimate decision, whether it's 24 hours or 48 hours or maybe different in different countries, right? Because, you know, people, have internet's more prevalent in certain countries than other countries. So all those kind of decisions I bet they're working through, and that's why we don't have a fully straight story. But, but something is going going on there. And, and I, I think this dovetails into the other big concern, which seems to be this idea that somehow you have to load a game onto the hard drive and that may require a fee right. for some kind of secondary install. This seems to play into the cloud that you would probably need it to be on the hard drive to access all the other, I guess, aspects of the game that, that involve this massive cloud system they're talking about. But it's also faster if you're running a game off of a hard drive yes. than if you're running it off of a disk drive, and you can therefore program the game to work in a certain, a certain way, right? And move people towards digital. But yes, you have to have a game authenticated in some way before you ever play it. I don't know if you have to keep re-authenticating it, but that's an extra security check, but then maybe you get to take advantage of super cool cloud computing things that, I mean, we can't be super cynical about all of this, yes, right? Yes, I agree. There's, I'm sure there are cool things about having a system, a game that's always online, that is able to get different data, but we saw with SimCity, people kind of like to play their games with the internet off from time to time. Now, do you think also, by not addressing these things, the, the bad news, that they're kind of letting the internet start to spin that story themselves? I mean, this is a very yeah. delicate marketing and PR issue for them. Well, and I would say that, you know, that's one of my concerns with all these press conferences. They're going to tell you sort of the story, and then, you know, 30 seconds later, Don Mattress on stage, I'm asking about Always Online. I would much rather sometimes the companies just sort of fess up to the gamers at home that are watching this saying, hey, here's what we're doing, here's how we're thinking about it. As Steven said, here are some of the benefits. It's like, I've heard that they're going to offload some AI in some games to the cloud, and that will be benefit. I mean, it's natural that any device you own right now would be connected to the internet in some form. I mean, the day and age of like people not connecting their home console to the internet is, is crazy. So I understand that you know they would want that. But yeah, I think part of it is they haven't figured it out, and there's so many stakeholders here. They have to talk to publishers about what they're doing, they have to talk about retailers, they have to think about you know the global impact of these types of things. And since it's all software, I think it's it, it may change and it sounds like, you know, I don't they haven't admitted this, but it sounds like the always online strategy may have changed over the past few months as well and it's kind of an ongoing conversation. Yes, I mean obviously they cannot be inured to what has been said out there on the internet and sort of that core gaming group. And that brings me to what I thought was one of the more confusing aspects of the presentation today. Uh, I think all three of us knew we were not going to see many games. That is something that they plan to do. Obviously they have 15 new titles. That's going to happen at E3. But with that in mind, who was watching today and who did Microsoft think they were talking to? I think they were trying to show something that felt futuristic. And I think that's one of the things where Sony had a little bit of struggle with PS4, is that I wasn't convinced when I was looking at the PS4 press conference that I was seeing something that felt, felt like it was plucked from the future. And if you remember how impressive the Project Natal that then got called the Connect demonstration was, that felt futuristic. Even the Wii Remote, we swung that around, felt futuristic. And in all these cases, in retrospect, they weren't as amazing as they looked to be, so maybe it's better in the case of Sony that it didn't, that it wasn't, you know, a bill of goods or something like that. But here, I think they were trying to impress people with things like the future of television. Television works differently in here, and gaming. They didn't really show us something that looked futuristic yet or felt futuristic, but maybe that is what E3 is. For. And part of that, I will say, is that I think a lot of gamers, myself included, are wondering what that futuristic leap is going to be for the next-gen consoles. And you know, the last leap was to HD. 
Now, I, I still think we don't really understand how much that leap's going to be. I mean, Call of Duty looks good, but it looks like another Call of Duty game. Forza looks good, it looks like another Forza game. And it's sort of, what is that leap going to be that's going to compel us that, uh, you know, these systems are going to be that much more powerful? I don't think we found that. Um, we found out about that from Xbox. And, you know, the thing that I think then gamers sort of moved back to is like, well, we want to see new IPs. We want to see bold new surprises. And I think it was good they included that Remedy project today. I don't know what it's really about, but it's like it's it's a new idea, and I think you know my one my one big criticism. I think they should have probably been more direct in saying these studios are working on these games. You're going to hear from Rarity Three. Don Matrick in the post show said we've got a new studio in Vancouver called Black Tusk. These guys are the best development team. He says they've ever had at Microsoft. They're working on a game. They'll unveil it at E3. They need to do a little bit more of that teasing to convince gamers that these are exclusives that matter to them. They're not you know ten small XBLA games that are coming to the system. No, no. I I I, I think the fact that they held that much back, I think that that wouldn't have given up any sense of surprise. It would have been more of a sense of anticipation about what you're going to be getting at E3. Now, I was quite impressed with what I saw with the television, and you can start to see some inklings of how that could be applied to games. I think, especially with the Skype, I could not help but think of EA's failed project Majestic yeah. from way back in the right. 2000s. Right. That there is this this sense, once again, of being online consistently, that you can start to have gameplay elements that really weren't possible. Yeah, well, the, you can do that Skype thing as basically the next level of in-game voice chat. And they're saying that every game will support it in some way. Uh, and yeah, you can be Skyping in the corner while, ta while, while playing a game. And they're also talking about it, Sony talked about this as well, capturing all these clips of what you're playing and sharing them. So it may be that the games themselves aren't going to feel futuristic, but it's how we engage with these games that's going to feel futuristic. That I won't, it won't be a lonely experience playing a game all by myself, but I'll be showing you, or you'll be spectating on the PS4, we don't know about here. Or we'll be talking on the phone while I'm playing a game, or on, on the Skype, right, while we're playing a game. And that may be the thing that feels like the future. Hey, the Connect stuff is pretty cool. Did you, you saw the Connect oh, yeah, demo, yeah. right? Oh, it is. It is. I mean, the, the the tech is there, and I think we now need to see that tech put in the hands of a developer. It could already be happening, and that's why we need to see the games. Those promises need to be manifest in something as clearly understandable as as, as a video game is. Well, and I agree, because that's one thing. You know, you look at the heart tracking, and like even be able to track your facial, you know, expression, smiling, frowning. I mean, imagine characters in a game sort of seeing that you smile and reacting to that as an NBC. It's a subtle thing that Connect can do, right? And I think uh, what I liked is that they didn't try to resell us Connect as it's how you're going to play, you know, a first person shooter, right? It's really more I think about the subtlety of how Connect can sort of introduce new experiences to the regular gameplay that you, you know, in Call of Duty, right? They talked about Connect working for it. I don't think you're going to be shooting with your hands in I, Call of Duty. I, I, I would like to think that, yes. Everyone knows that's a very that. bad idea. Yeah, but let's talk about the heart thing, because remember Nintendo came out with the Vitality Sensor, and then they never put it out. This was going to have games that reacted to your biorhythms or whatever. Never did anything, but it was kind of a cool idea. Valve supposedly doing biometrics. That connect is checking your heartbeat, reading it, by looking at your face. Let's admit, that is amazing. So it looks and like so, the blood vessels in your face yes, are telling us. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, so the fact is, any game you're playing might now be capable of seeing what your heart rate is. And I can imagine a ton of cool features. Well, that yes, could be music and things like that. And that's the kind of stuff that I think would have been awesome if we had, you know, Todd Howard walk out and talk about how in the next, you know, game he's working on, how these things are going to be impacted. It's sort of that, that's just what the gamers wanted to hear, and we didn't get a lot of that. But I also understand why they made the pivot to entertainment and TV, because I think right now, given the state of sort of the games and development, I don't think they had a lot of that to talk about. So the new shiny thing to talk about is, hey, All we can change your experience, entertainment. And, you know, in the past, Microsoft has always, I think, had this issue where they've, you know, shown connect Sesame Street and then gone to Halo and it's been stuff that hasn't really interested core gamers. Everything they showed today I think is is interesting to core gamers. That TV stuff, the entertainment stuff, Halo snapping, TV. Halo TV show, that's all stuff that's interesting to gamers. It's not off sort of topic but with void of any sort of new major game announcements beyond the Remedy Project, I think that's why some gamers are feeling a little frustrated right now. Well, also, to, if, if they saved all of this for E3, we would have been sitting through an insufferable three-hour press conference. So I think the three of us can feel a little breath of relief on that. Um, I, I think just for a final thought, they've done what they did today. It seems to have gotten you know strong and mixed reactions. What do they need to do three weeks from now at E3 to kind of you know put the bow on this narrative yeah. they're trying to tell us? I mean, I think we know exactly what it is. It's, it's show a lot of games, and I have a, a good sense of some of the third-party games they have there. I think first party, Don Magic said they have this new Black Tusk studio. I've heard there's some other teams that we'll probably see there. Um, you know, what's Rare working on? Hopefully we'll hear about that there. Um, I think they've just got to show a lot of games in a big, profound way on stage at E3, and that's what people want. 
Um, so I think it's really as simple as that. And, you know, no one's going to hold their grade, though, until June 10th. And I think that's the challenge they face is right now in the short term, people are going to be a little skeptical about the games. But come June 10th, they really deliver, you know, 21 gun salute to gamers. That's going to, you know, really have a big impact. Um, do, do you think games will put all of this in the past in the eyes of the agitated that are out there? I think games will help a lot. I think clarity to some of the things that have just become more confusing, the online, the used game stuff. Interesting thing if you're following the narrative though, the next people who get to go are not Sony or not Nintendo. Microsoft gets to go next. So they get to continue this. They're first in E3, then we get EA, Ubisoft, I don't know if it's in that order. Then Sony, if you don't count Nintendo, some people don't, let's just be honest, Sony's actually gonna get the last word to get to go back at Microsoft. If you do count Nintendo, Nintendo are actually the people who get the last word in all of this. So there's so much more drama to come in just a few weeks. This just brought back memories of Oxford debate in high school, I can't believe it. Um, Jeff, Steven, thank you so much for your time. I'll, I'll see you in three weeks. You need three. Yeah.